So there's always been this kind of tug of war between what an artist can do that, a, that, that tech can't. The ones that are most successful embrace that tech and just make their skill or what they want to say even more profound. Technology shifts technique. Correct, without a doubt. Today, I'm joined by co-host Corey Grosser, who has previously interviewed on The Bomb, and we'll be having a discussion with Joey Jones. Joey comes from over 20 years of experience as a creative director, designer, and is currently vice president and executive creative director at Candy Digital, a Web3 design agency that currently has several joint non-fungible token NFT projects with the MLB, NFL, NASCAR, and Getty Images. Our conversation unpacks the initial challenges of the broad decentralized Web3 marketplace and its adoption, the importance and opportunities in the developing metaverse, and the exclusivity value of digital art, collectibles, and long-term goals to make sure the space becomes more viable. We'll also be discussing the recent breakthroughs in augmented reality, its gamification, and what the future has in store for its soon-to-be widespread applications. Here's our conversation. We live in a time where design and technology touch every aspect of our lives. But where did it all come from? Who designed it? How is it built and brought to market? What will it look like in a year? Two years? A hundred years? From the phones and smartwatches that help us in our day to day to the cutting edge spaceships and 3D printers that are leading us into the future, modern design is constantly shaping the way we work, communicate, problem solve, and play. And every new design, big or small, starts with an idea and a bill of materials. I'm Magenta Strongheart, and this is The Bomb, where we talk to leading innovators in the tech world and celebrate the transformational power of design. I think a natural start is kind of your, you know, your background and how you got into um, creative directing. Sure. So maybe we can start there. Does that sound good to you? Oh, that sounds great. Okay. Jones, it's very nice to have you here. Yeah, yeah thank you. welcome it's, to the it's bomb. Great to be here. It's great <laughs> thank to be you here. for doing this. So, how I started. Um, so, uh, originally, I, I was in architecture, and uh, fortunate enough to go to a school that um, was developing CAD software uh, as well. So, at Ohio State, they're inventing a program called Form Z, uh, which was one of the first uh, true ways to for architects for designers um to model space uh, and then render it out and uh, it scared the heck out of uh traditional you know uh, 2d guys um but it became really um you know for me a place where i could quickly get some results instead of spending nights and nights modeling a, a, a you know a physical model mm-hmm. i think those those if i look back that was probably the first um epiphany where um there was always going to have to be uh you know a digital and a physical side at creating something whether it was architecture or story or product or um you know a car um and so uh going uh, i was fortunate enough to get an internship with one of my heroes tom main at morphosis um and worked for him for and did an internship for three months, um, doing Form Z for him, and and got a bird's eye, uh, bird's eye, uh, you know, a, a close, upfront, candid, um, unflinching look at what it means to be a star architect, you know, an architect that at that star caliber level. And um, this was before he won the Pritzker, so he was he was he was obviously like a star, but hadn't reached the caliber he is today, and. Um, after three months realized, you know, I don't know if being an architect is for me, not necessarily. I didn't, I loved it. I just didn't know. I didn't think I could wait till I was 50 in order to get to the level where he was at. I had the same feeling when I did architecture in high school, where I was like, I want to do like Frank Gehry buildings, but I'm not going to get to do that for like 40 years. And that doesn't sound fun doing all the steps before that. Absolutely right. And so that impatience, uh made it easy for me to convert to animation uh, as soon as i started having a camera fly through a space and have an inkling of a story i was then hooked and um uh, rem- and, and and took a step away from architecture went back to grad school um and studied animation film and design so your love of animation 
the seeds of that were basically software related to architecture? Well, I think if I look back, I was always interested in story. I was always interested in animation. Never thought I could make a living doing it, if I'd be honest. Uh, this is me growing up in the middle of Ohio and not really seeing the opportunities that, you know, that are, that are there, right? If you're living, if you're living in Los Angeles, you can clearly see people making a living doing animation. Can you walk us through what the interface was like with Form Z? I'm trying to imagine, like, at that time, what were early, you know, CAD interfaces like? Yeah. So, you know, believe it or not, there was a big wheel and you had to crank it. (laughs) Were you inputting coordinates? (laughs) Uh, Close. I mean, it was very rudimentary. Um, And, uh, but the the UI was, you know, uh, I mean, this shit, this is, this is, uh, this is a long time ago. This is 30 years ago. So, um, it was good enough for, for, for you to build uh, architecture. And if you used it enough, you got really fast at it. Um, and with architecture, that is, um, for the most part, um, platonic and faceted and not soft surface. Form Z and the computer uh, abilities at that point were perfect. You know, it was, it was a lot easier to make a right angle than it was yeah, to make a curve. Organic, organic yeah, soft shapes. surfed. Yeah. But back to your question, Corey, I don't think it was necessarily software that led me into animation. I think what it was, was coming out here, working for Tom Main, and actually seeing people, particularly in the game space at that point, game industry, making a good living doing what, doing animation. Um, it was that um, happenstance of being out here, having the sort of confidence to see that was like, well, darn do I want to spend the next, you know, 20 ish, 20 ish, 30 ish years building up to a point where Tom Main was at? Or I can kind of jump in real quickly. And, and what's, you know, for better or for worse, digital gives you fairly fast results, really fast results in some, in some cases. The older I get, the more I realize that you still have, there's still a significant amount of patience with digital as well if you want to get to that caliber. Because a feature film, an animated feature film, probably takes more time than live action, right? Correct. It does, without a doubt. Um, it's relative. I'm talking about, you know, I'm still, you know, the, the projects, I, so I'm not in feature film. Um, at one point I was. Um, Nowadays, my the length of my projects are you know three months to maybe six months, uh, and to an architect that's a blink of an eye, right? <laughs> um, to to me, it, it does it does require a, a bit of patience to do something that may take may at the end of the day last ten seconds, but you spent six months making those ten seconds with a team of you know a dozen or so people. Yeah, so so out of grad school, I did a short film that did really well, uh, won a bunch of awards, and uh, myself and and a few of the guys that worked on the film started a company right out of school. And did that for twelve years, and we built a, a team of about thirty some thirty some odd um, uh, a, a team of of women and men, and um, did mostly marketing. Marketing paid the bills, and at night we would try to come up with stories to pitch around town, and so. That was a real um, eye opener into how Hollywood works and the intersection of commerce and design and ambition and um, dreams and reality, dreams <laughs> and uh, handshake. You know, I, so I saw a lot uh, how hard that is. Like if you if you if you think about, you know, I remember I'll never forget in in school at Ohio State. Uh, a professor named Mark Robbins ended up becoming the director of the NEA. We were bagging on some uh, building and his point, I'll never forget it was you can, you can criticize that building, but you also have to remember how much of a feat it is just to get something made, just to get that building done is a feat in itself. And that architect should be congratulated. And it stuck with me. And then I, you, know, you start to realize, even like with a film, trying to get a film made, how freaking hard that is. Um, and so um, uh, going through that, you know, I, I quickly realized that screenwriting was going to be another full commitment and probably going to take me many years 
to, to get to a point where I could feel comfortable. And um, before I knew it, uh, 12 years had passed and we built up a, a company that did, like I said, a lot of gaming and marketing and you know, game, game marketing and a lot of theatrical um, uh, marketing as well. And then uh, fell into advertising fully and became a creative director in advertising, uh, doing a lot of campaigns for Microsoft Xbox. And I uh, worked on the Oculus uh, headset a bunch, um, did some work um, in, um, in narrative as it pertains to trying to sell a game. Uh, and that was, that was, a, that was a great um, fun ride. Uh, and now I find myself uh, in the world of, of NFTs. I remember uh, he called me up and said, Hey, watch the Super Bowl because I have a commercial <laughs> during the Super Bowl, which I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Joey. That is pretty that's cool. Something. Yeah. That is something. I mean, the whole irony in that is over the, I don't know, geez, 300, 400 commercials that I've worked on and helped direct and what have you. If I had to pick one that would I would want to be on the Super Bowl, that would be in probably the bottom 10. <laughs> I mean, it, it, was, it was something that a game company called us up at the last second and you know, uh, they had, uh, they got a deal for the 15 second spot and needed something in, in you know, a couple of months and we pulled it off. Nice. Yeah. But <laughs> it was, it was cool. Call. It was cool to see it, you know, for 15 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> on the, and it's on like the, the creme de creme, like yeah. the opportunity yeah. to showcase, I mean, commercial work for sure. Yeah. So that's exciting. So that's the journey. Tell us what, what do you do now? So I work for a company called Candy Digital. Um, you know, what we do uh, essentially is um, produce digital collectibles that, that reinvents what fandom is. Um, so our partnerships are with uh, Major League Baseball, MLB, with NASCAR, with uh, WWE, uh, with um, Netflix, and we recently announced with Getty Images. Wow. Congrats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it runs the gamut of sports and entertainment and culture. Did you collect baseball cards as a kid? I did actually. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't a huge baseball player, um, but you know, with sports, um, there is this odd—not maybe not odd. I think a lot of people can relate. Um, you know, you get an experience of going to a baseball stadium as a kid, and instantly becoming a fan and finding an identity with that that team. And that becomes part of your persona and you, you become attached to that and you just collect that team. So I, I, my uncle took me to a Red Sox game and I became a Red Sox fan and would only collect uh, Wade Boggs and Roger Clemens and a guy named Mike Greenwell. And so, <laughs> so I was a huge Red Sox fan as a kid. Where are those cards now? <laughs> well, they're in my garage. Do you collect MLB NFTs now? I do. You know, I, I you know. I sort of have to, right? <laughs> I, do you I would, do it because you want to or because you yeah, have to? Yeah, <laughs> no, definitely I want to. Definitely I want to. I mean, you know, there is a whole psychology in collecting. There's there's definitely pros and cons to to what that obsession is uh, and to what that says about you and and why you do it. So we can get into that and that could that could last a couple hours, yeah. right? And to a certain degree we we think about that. Our core mission is to celebrate the fans experience to get him or her or they what they uh, figure out a way for them to feel even closer to that team or that player or that artist than they than they could be otherwise so it sounds like do you think most of your um market or audience is coming from the traditional fan bases of those kind of categories the mlb fans the NASCAR fans, or is it like, what do you think the split is between the the original fans and people that are interested in collecting NFTs and are choosing this as the type that they're going to invest in? Yeah, it's it's a great question. Uh, that question, um, I could answer it very differently now than I would have, let's say, nine months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so we're talking in February of 2023, where... Um, the market is definitively down. Uh, we're in what's called a, a crypto winter right? or a NFT winter or what have you. 
uh, nine months ago, I would say that there is a large percentage of people who um, were buying NFTs, buying baseball NFTs, MLB one, ones uh, speculatively um, for, a, for a quick flip to make money. And, you know, a lot of people were made a ton of money doing that, particularly with our, with our cards, our, our digital cards. We, Candy, I would argue, I, at least I'm speaking for myself, maybe, I'm much more interested in the fan who is purchasing our product because they're a fan and they like what we've created. They really care about the content. <laughs> they care yeah. about the work. Um, you know, I think one thing that separates candy, uh, and obviously I'm biased, <laughs> uh, from another uh, NFT creator is we do put a hell of a lot of work into every single product that we make. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, that's, that's another reason what we hear back from the customer base, the, the users is that's what they appreciate. And that's the reason why they keep purchasing or keep coming back. You know, right now, NFT is a, is a bad word. You know, it's definitely, it's endless. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely got a bad rap right now. Maybe, um, maybe appropriately. So, um, I don't think so. I think at some point NFT is going to be recoined, rebranded. Uh, cause it does have so much baggage right now. Um, our world is going progressively more and more digital. If we can agree to that, then we can clearly say that, okay, we need to figure out a way to have some sort of ownership and way to authenticate what is real quotes and not in the digital space. NFTs give you that. There's a lot of people when NFTs, um, you know, were hot, let's call it 2021 and really took advantage. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's, what's going to happen to, a um, to a play new tech like this. Of course, yeah. The good news is that this, um, crash you can call has, as I think wiped out that. And so if you talk to a lot of people who are really enthusiasts and evangelists of NFTs, they actually welcomed this crash. Because it cleared away all of the garbage. And so the people who are really uh, in it to win it, the people who are really in it because uh, they see the, the vision of the long haul are sticking around and really seeing this as a cleansing moment in a good way. Can you kind of verbally illustrate for us uh, like your favorite product that you've helped create just for maybe those that are listening who can't imagine what an MLB NFT yeah. is? The one that comes to mind, I think the the most for for me just right now is we did an NFT with um, Richard Petty, so arguably um, the goat of of NASCAR. And you met him? Uh, yeah. So so this is pretty cool. So he was totally on board. Um, he didn't quite get it until we said, "Well, take a you know a physical diecast car on your phone and combine them." And now you have an NFT. Diecast cars in NASCAR world is the equivalent to a baseball card. Um, collectors collect diecast cars and they have the driver sign them, just like just like a baseball player would sign a card. So um, we um, took some of uh, his historic photos. We partnered with a photographer, uh, Don Smile, who had who had had a collection of photography that no one had seen before. This was uh, unarchived or, you know, unarchived footage. And we took those photos and made really beautiful cinemagraphs and had a di digital signature on, on them. At the same time, we then interviewed them and took uh, sound bites from the interview, paired it with the cinemagraph and his digital signature, and I think produced a hundred of those and sold those. Now you also had the opportunity if you bought one of those NFTs, you were then um, in a, let's call it a raffle, and you got to then print it, uh, a signed physical print of that image. That's cool. Yep. Um, and then also one lucky um, fan was actually able to, um, we, we then auctioned off, we did a, uh, did a digital bust. So we sculpted Richard Petty in the likeness of Richard Petty and his iconic Stetson hat and shades. Did you 3D scan him to do that? No. So we we did we could have, um, but we didn't. We actually did it from scratch. 
um, brought in a really talented modeler who specializes in the likeness of celebrities. And basically the digital bust um, did a 360 camera move around there, rendered that in this beautiful um, petty blue uh, 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 metal. Mm -hmm. Also paired that with some footage uh, of the interview and sold a one of one, which means it's a one version of that ever was minted on the blockchain. And the person who purchased that through an auction uh, then was able to meet Richard Petty in person and do a, a, a drive by with him, which is to say, like, the reason why I like that so much is because not only is it uh, a nice example of, you know, digital and physical kind of multimedia in each. In yep, it's experiential also. It's experiential, but also like one of the most important things to us at Candy is that it, it really tells his story. So everything we're trying to do, we're trying to imbue storytelling that makes these movies or JPEGs or whatever it is even more meaningful. The misleading thing today, and maybe the reason why a lot of people don't like NFTs or are suspicious or what have you, is that they think of NFTs as a, as a, uh, a dancing monkey or a, uh, a 2D drawing that their, their two-year-old drew. But in fact, NFTs, the way that, that I've heard them described, which I really like, is you can think of them as a pointer. Now, whether that points to a JPEG or a dancing monkey or to a website or to a ticket or to entrance into a theater or to uh, whatever, ha whatever you have digitally, it just points to it and authenticates it. Um, and if you think about it in that respect, then NFT can be literally anything. Uh, and that that's that's pretty darn exciting. Now the tech is not there yet, <laughs> and we're still trying to figure out. Like that's that's what really attracts me to the space we're in right now is because we are on the forefront of seeing what's possible. So this is a Web 3.0 kind of question, this is definitely right? Web what, 3. what does, in your definition, what is Web 3.0? Yeah, let's start. Let's start at the beginning. So Web 1.0. Uh, let's call it like, you know, the nineties, what have you, that for most people, um, is, is when the web was, uh, read only. So, um, you would go to a site and publishing was the best metaphor and the best way to bring content to the website. Um, and that became web 1.0 it was just read only. So you looked at dirty pictures. I think you're speaking for yourself there, <laughs> Mr. Grosser. He's projecting. He's definitely projecting. <laughs> it was read and look only. Right. Uh, Web 2.0 is, uh, let's call it like the, you know, the early mid 2000s where you could then read and write. You could post, you could generate your own content and put it up there. Revolutionary for a lot, uh, particularly, uh, you know, for uh, people who wanted a voice and um an audience and so facebook google uh, uh instagram all, uh, twitter gave them a platform uh, the problem with that is that those six companies uh really dominate and own the internet we are their product right we don't own it so when when i post a picture of instagram or what have you like we don't own that anymore it's the, then the property of theirs and that's why it's free right it makes sense. Web 3.0 is read, write, and own. So what it proposes to do is allow a mechanism for you to um, get Facebook um, out of the way or Instagram or Twitter and what have you and share your work and have an instant connection to your audience, bypassing that. And that can be done through a token. So an NFT, a non-fungible token. So executives at the large tech companies, Meta and Google. Yeah. They're nervous? Oh, I would I would assume so. Maybe not now because NFTs <laughs> no one likes them, but uh, <laughs> early in the NFT days, people said, oh, this is going to be awesome for games. Because the cool thing about NFTs uh, is what's called interoperability. They're not owned by any platform. So think about buying a skin in Fortnite and being able to take that skin to a different game. 
It sounds awesome, but it doesn't sound awesome to Epic Games, right? Like they own that platform. They are centralized. They're not decentralized. They're centralized. And so it's, it's, in, uh, it's in their best financial interest to be closed off, which is completely antithetical to Web3. And so that will always be that push and pull with, with Web3. I think, I think if I'm, if I'm Zuckerberg, yeah, I think, I think it's going to be eventual, but it, they're going to fight kicking and screaming to prevent that. In Web 2.0, everyone's a creator, right? I would say yeah. it's empowered people to be their own creators. So, um, you know, I just watch my kids are infatuated with YouTube and they want to be like, you know, and they spend their time, like, I guess, play, you know, they all have play dates and make like pretend YouTube videos. It's, you know, so it's, it's really a kind of move to a consumption to a creation kind of flip. Yeah. So in web 3.0, does that continue or, or what happens with this kind of paradigm of the creator and the consumer? Well, it definitely continues. And I think that's a pretty cool observation. Here's, here's the, here's the nuance to that is that when your kids are using YouTube, they are abiding by YouTube's rules. And so YouTube is helping them build their audience. But the moment that YouTube deems them not appropriate or has too much of an audience or wants to do anything with their content, YouTube has every right to do it. They're at the mercy of YouTube. So what Web3 proposes is that you get rid of YouTube and you actually have a one-to-one -one relationship with their, with, their, with their fans. It's now decentralized. And what's even cooler than that is if their fans had a token, an NFT to their, to their podcast, um, they can then decide the scarcity amount of those tokens. They can say there's only a hundred of these, or there's only a thousand or a million. They can say that the first, uh, 10,000 that purchase these tokens have this, uh, a loyalty structure. Um, they can then uh, reward those, uh, utility or those, those, those owners, um, through, um, through digital means, whether that's an email or a um, uh, private Discord channel or in real life experiences. And in order to get into those in real life experiences, you would need to be an owner of the token. Um, and to a certain degree, that's how um, board, uh, you know, uh, board, uh, board apes have really become or were, maybe they still are, uh, so incredibly valuable is because of that exclusivity that they carried with them. You're, you're basically invited to very private parties that were awesome. And you can only get into those parties if you're a board ape owner. Right. Maybe one of the challenges or, or, or question I have for you and to use a metaphor of like photographs. Yeah. You know, I think about my mom, you know, would have photo albums where she would print out the photos and then you would flip through her wedding, you know, us as young kids. And, and now we have obviously photos are digital. They come from your phone. And yet I'm not sure that we have that experience of, it's almost like it's so easy to store yeah. that we almost lose them a little bit. Yeah. How do you not lose all these photos? You know, like, I, I don't know. How do you not get lost in the digital noise? Well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I have the solution to that. Uh, Come on, Jake. <laughs> You're a smart guy. Come on, but, 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 but what, what you do bring up for me, which I think will eventually be one of the possible killer uh, apps for AR is the ability to um, pin a digital image to a wall and have that be permanent quote unquote, right? So the day where AR is collectively uh, part of our world and part of our working day, where um, anyone that has a pair of glasses that look just like these has the opportunity to opt into that, uh, that world, or we'll maybe call it a metaverse, and be able to go into someone's space and see those digital photographs either come alive or flip through carousel or um, be talking back to them. That I think is when 
particularly NFTs, are going to be commonplace. There's no doubt in my mind. So you mean we, as soon as the metaverse is more pervasive, popular, yes. pervasive, yep. good word. Yep. So, you know, there is a um, part of digital collecting, which is surrounded around apparel. And, you know, we, we've seen the infancy of tracking, right? So you, you go on Snapchat and what have you and put on a filter and put on glasses that, that match your hair or change your hair color. And it, it's, it's pretty darn good. <laughs> so think about what that's going to be like five years, 10 years, 15 years from now. Uh, it's, it's fairly um, agreed upon through most people working in this space that at some point when a pair of goggles that controls what you see, you will be able to, at the flip of a switch, um, turn me into Bono and look and even speak and act like Bono, uh, but only with a pair of glasses on, right? Do you think when we're at that place, everyone will just be walking around in like neutral outfits because what they wear will be what's, you know, seen through the yeah, I mean, goggles I, or the glasses? I, I don't. I, I don't. I mean, it is, that is like, that's, that, that is definitely uh, a trap to like kind of fall into is like, um, my point of view is that it'll always just augment what we have that it won't ever become completely reliant on on AR or whatever it is at that point, whatever digital is. I think there's always going to be a combination. Hybrid. I think that's where it becomes most successful. Yeah. You know, I think as, as look, I'm, you know, for better, for worse, fully immersed into the digital world. As much as I wish I was more tactical and had physical stuff that I could touch and feel and throw, um, everything that I create today um, to make a living is completely on a TV screen or a 2D screen right now. It'll change at some point. Um, I, but I do firmly think that um, it'll always be augmenting what we are already experiencing. I don't see a world where we're, we'll be um, happy being completely in a VR world. We'll be back after a short break. After the break, we'll speak with Joey on his involvement in making an alternative reality game, or ARG, for promoting the popular show Stranger Things, and how it may become the next huge format for programming, content, and media. Welcome back to The Bomb. I'm joined today with co-host Corey Grosser for our continued conversation with Joey Jones. We'll soon discuss Joey's personal take on seeing web technology starting with Web 1.0 grow into the Web 3 space we're seeing evolve, become integrated in media and marketing approaches today. A lot of what you're describing when you were detailing the um, the uh, NASCAR um, NFT, a lot of these things are still kind of engaged with or enjoyed through, as you mentioned, like through a screen or somewhere in-person prints, physical. Do you see anything in the works or what are you excited about as far as once it doesn't have to be tied to an existing technology we have right now or something we're used to? Yeah. So the answer to that, um, once again, my knee-jerk reaction to that is it um, comes down to what how we can tell a more compelling story. When we worked with Netflix and we did a campaign or a drop with Stranger Things, um, we did a uh, we produced and and um, you know executed a ARG, an alternate reality game, which basically uh, meant that we uh, embedded clues, hidden clues, into a series of of drops and posters. And um, in conjunction and based on the running narrative of Stranger Things of the season. And so uh, fans were invited to participate by solving clues and literally going to a site and um, using the light bright, which is a part prop in the, in the series, to um, create a, an art piece that if they did it perfectly, it, it then got them into the, to the next chapter and what have you. And you earned NFTs 
by doing that. And so you might ask, well, why would you want to do that? So um, first off, it was a fan, a, a way for a fan to flex their fandom to say that I, you know, I love this show so much that I was willing to spend a couple of days trying to figure out this code. Um, it also um, got them invited to into a Discord channel that where they were able to meet other fans and talk about the show and talk about the next code. And as the game developed, we saw literally in front of us fans working with other fans who they they just met through the Discord working on the puzzles. That to me, like that's that's really special, right? Um, if you take that another step forward, which no one today I don't think has done this yet, is let's say that um, instead of us doing this campaign after the show has been dropped and made, that we're producing NFTs as the show is being made or as the film is being made. And so uh, a fan would be able to get a token that in some ways would influence how the narrative plays out. So if you think about it with episodic TV, um, the rate and the speed that f- that TV is being produced, I think that that would be pretty darn cool. If a show was released every few weeks as opposed to one drop with all 20 episodes or 10 episodes, you drop one episode uh, one month and then you wait another month and then another month. And in the meantime, the fans are deciding how the story's played out. So you choose your own adventure. <laughs> yep, through, through, through their tokenization. I think they're starting like some shows you can now watch in different order, correct? With You're it, right. And the narrative changes based on the order that you... Right. But that's, I would argue that's a very singular moment, right? That's just one fan having their private experience. Mm-hmm. What I'm talking about is a collection. So the community shifts. The community. The, yep. Yep. Shifts the narrative. Yep. So it is, it would be, you know, uh, arguably very web three like, right? Because it's, it's, it's more decentralized. It's not one center organization deciding how the script there's multiple people that allow to decide. And again, we move from consumers of entertainment to partial creators of yep. entertainment. And owners. Yep. So that that's pretty straightforward. And if you, if you, you can get really excited very fast thinking about like someone like Netflix or Hulu or something like that, that, that has, that's creating content. When you talk about sports, um, that gets pretty exciting. Right now, we have these um, you know, we have these three platforms, uh, three products. Um, we have a an icon, which is literally think of a baseball card, but on steroids because it uh, includes a movie of the player, uh, includes a sort of a two and a half D fly through, and it, it's it's you know arguably quite sexy in its graphic treatment and such like that. Uh, then we have uh, we call them highlights which are basically um, a clip of that player or that team for that day. Uh, And then we have tickets. And so um, let's say you're at a baseball park uh, and uh, you're seeing seeing the Red Sox. I'm actually a Dodgers fan now, but let's say you're playing the Red Sox, play the Dodgers. And and you're there for um, a a, a pretty, uh, pretty cool milestone. Someone hits their 100th and 50,000th uh, home run. Well, now you have, and you, you have an uh, NFT of that ticket. So you now you have a proof that you were at that um, place um, for arguably eternity. <laughs> and, um, and then let's say um, uh, a certain amount of those fans are, and then you'll say you also have that player's icon. You can then pair those together. And then you take a picture with your son at the ballpark. You can take that picture and also uh, include it into that NFT. And the NFT can build. That's the, that's that's the really cool thing about these digital it's collectibles. Like a time is capsule. They're time capsules. They're little like passports that contain your journey, and they're also dynamic. They're never static. So, which again, back to my original point of like today, most people think of NFTs as that um, that you know. Uh, JPEG, when in fact the the really exciting NFTs are anything but a static one image. They are much more elaborate. To, to ask a difficult question, you know, when we talk 
sit here talking like you have to like kind of focus on what you're saying and like imagine these scenarios right yeah how does how do we get to the point where the average baseball fan that doesn't want to imagine these scenarios just experiences it just it, it becomes as like intuitive as collecting a physical card which is quite easy to do so how do what's it going to take is it technology is it yeah just uh, we'll just start to absorb it. What's it going to take that the average fan, this makes complete sense. So <laughs> that question, I think we'd, we'd probably be making uh, a, a lot more money. I think everyone <laughs> would be making a lot more money. Um, I do think there is, there is a parallel that I've often said about AR and VR, right? It's like when the websites, uh, you know, I, I'm old enough to know what it was like to, you know, feel what like web one was or 1.0 was like right where like oh you, you scroll and you oh there's more content down here or all oh, the pages are always up here or underline means it's hyperlinked right a blue type with an underline like, like that means it's blue right so some of these things we now take for second nature like we take it for granted that's like it's it's completely obvious to us we had to learn that though we had to learn it right and much like ar uh whenever i put a headset on someone that uh, has never played with AR, um, they typically stand in one place. It's quite, it's quite funny. And until you actually grab their shoulders and move them around and they give them that liberty, oh, AR is not about standing in one place, but it's about moving around the space. And oh, it's gesture control. You can, you know, you can bloom stuff and you can grab stuff and pin stuff over here. And there's always oh, a toolbox. Oh, oh, what's up there? Right. Like we're so used to this like uh, 16 by nine, uh, you know, yeah. box to look at things. AR is much like web w websites were like, okay, so now fast forward to NFTs. I think at some point NFTs are also going to have to have that where it's going to be sort of second nature. Oh, I'm going to see a show. I need to get that NFT. My mom was making fun of my father because he tried to, he tried to pinch to zoom a physical map. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so there is already this kind of some of well, these new things. Yeah, I was going to say, like you see babies, kids do it all the yeah, time. Yeah, like one year old are trying to go like, like this, this on a ma magazine. Right. Magazine. They're like, it's broken. <laughs> and yeah. yeah. And yeah. It, so I was going to say, I think that the adoption curve for tech is only getting faster and faster, like with each generation. So I, see, I, think I, I suppose it, it's, it's super gonna, generational because if yeah. you talk about the metaverse, like because I think we're, our kids grew up in the metaverse, whether it's Roblox or Minecraft, yeah. they're already socializing in virtual space. Like and it's completely 100 percent normal to them. Yeah, it's not as challenging or surprising to yep. grasp. And their digital identity is also, uh, you know, a given, right? So they're also going to be growing up and come to an age where they're going to have a digital presence and, and they're going to want to flex, quote unquote, right? They're going to want to have an identity and, and, and how they, how they show who they are is going to be intimately tied to their authentic things or, uh, uh, uh visual cues that they give. And, and so NFTs give you that opportunity to say, yes, this is, this is my, uh, you know, uh, Red Sox jersey. And it's a one of 30 that they gave out at that game that I was at. And I have number one and I wear it in my digital presence. One of my friends said, you know, their dad um, had bought an NFT and it was like a still image. I can't remember what it was, but he just bought a TV to show it all the time on sure. the wall, on the TV, which I think is kind of funny going back to what we're saying about we're still in this in-between where, you know, people are adapting things to fit current technology. And it's sort of a funny mix of tech. And it's like, you know, we're just so familiar with photos on the wall or paintings. So now I'm going to put this digital painting on a TV on the yeah, wall, you yep, know? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, there is a whole little cottage industry of, um, of devices that show digital objects. Uh, we have a partnership with a company called Infinite Objects where you can, you know, quote unquote, print your NFT. But instead of a, um, a physical sheet of paper, you now get a physical, uh, beautifully done acrylic encased LED screen. Do you like that? Like, do you think that's cool or do you think that's going backwards almost or I wouldn't not say backwards. Doing, the, doing the content justice? Um, no, I think it gives it justice. I wouldn't say it's going backwards. Um, am I greedy to have it be something different? Yeah. Um, but we've done a pretty cool job of giving some of the 
really talented baseball players one of these infinite objects and as they unbox it and like pulled up like they quickly get it and the C it still has impact yeah and the C like i can only imagine what it's like to be a baseball player growing up as a kid having a collection idolizing these players and now you're a baseball player and you have your own your own baseball card like that's got to be something else right so for these guys to film them open these boxes, and we do it for marketing uh, and then open up and hold one of these things and see them come to life and see this play that's been recorded uh memorialized um i think they like they totally get it and they're totally bought in right i suppose part of collecting is the hunt then you know and so what how it's does in this digital world yeah, how does the hunt work yeah so for mlb in particular um you purchase a pack just like you would purchase a a regular baseball card pack so it's a blind pack uh-huh. and then you get a, a certain amount of cards and you hope they you, you hope now what's what's also um new and revolutionary with with digital baseball cards is that you can instantly then go to our secondary marketplace and buy more cards or sell the ones you don't want within seconds uh and um, there is uh, infographics and visual um, data uh, charts that will show you what's the most expensive this card sold for, what's the cheapest this card sold for, how many others are trying to sell this card. Uh, and so you quickly see the value of that card if, if that's something you're interested in. Who's deciding what cards, which which stars end up in which packs? Is it an algorithm? You know, is it? You, Joey, behind a computer no, saying, I mean. it's all Joey. <laughs> Blame Joey if you're unhappy yeah. with your pack. <laughs> no, it definitely is randomized. It's randomized. It's definitely randomized. Yeah. I, I know that for a fact. Um, and um, one of the drops we did last year, it randomly, we gave out eight um, tickets to the World Series. So if you um, pulled a pack, and what we did is we intentionally made this opportunity only for the bottom tier of the rarity structure, right? So when you get a, a baseball card, there are five tiers. Uh, it goes from you know core to uncommon to epic to rare to legendary. And as you go up that spectrum, there's less and less of those cards. So, you know, a core, there could be, you know, a thousand. And this language core, epic, legendary, yeah. that's across all collectibles. Cause I think I've heard my kids talk about Pokemon cards sure. in a similar, in a similar fashion. Is to that- a large extent, it's shared amongst a lot of collectibles. Okay. Um, but, um, so like Pokemon epics might be slightly different than candy's epics. Uh-huh. But yeah, th- these are common terms used for that rarity structure. Legendaries at the very top, the pinnacle, typically denote a one of a one. So when you get a legendary, that is a legendary. That is you're the only you're the only owner of that. And typically with a legendary, it automatically comes with a physical reward. So when someone pulls a one of one of of uh, Shohei Otani, uh, he or she or they are going to get some sort of jersey or sign picture or baseball or something like that from from that player i think the other cool thing i mean this this i i don't know if i completely buy into this i guess i do is um that digital baseball card's never gonna get bent it's never gonna get water damage it's never gonna get oxidized right and it's digital or be a little bit off center or be a little <laughs> off center misprint misprint Sometimes we actually talk about, joke about doing intentional like accidents. Do some little. <laughs> They're cracked glass or something like that, you know? Um, yeah, I looked at my baseball cards recently and if it was in the center in perfect condition, it was like $15,000. <laughs> but because it was a little off center, it was like four bucks. I was like, yeah. I, was like, wow. I have so many comic books that way. I have like X-Men that would be worth, I'd be able to pay my kids college, but they're worth pennies because they're a little tear or a rip or, you know, got too much sun on them. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's something to be said about that. The reason why I think I, I bump a little bit is because um, there, I still do respect the physicality of stuff, right? I still do respect that. Now, do I want both? Heck yes. And that's, that's why I'm still, you know, really excited about what I do. 
is there anything your surprise hasn't changed faster? Like you were yeah. part of the team helping market Oculus, you mentioned. Yep. Yeah, and HoloLens. Yeah. yeah, are you surprised it's not, you know, more commonplace or that um, there hasn't been a cheaper version created that yeah. everyone's using for um, work or anything else? Or is there anything in technology or just like, how has it not been made faster? Yeah, yes and no. Yes and no. I, I follow the news that comes out on how HoloLens Magic Leap, um, you know, snap, uh, snaps, uh, you know, Oculus, um, you know, uh, Facebook's attempts, Meta's attempts to get a device out into the world. And, um, you know, it, it and like, as, as you said, I, I was uh, on the ground level of marketing the HoloLens um, from, you know, their initial release and and helped uh, make uh, over two dozen video documentaries of um, industries using the HoloLens, whether it's Volvo or um, medicine or education. Um, and there was these incredible uh, applications that was, were, were using AR um, in profound ways. Um, and you're, 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 you're seeing that still, not on, I don't think not on the, not on the spectrum that we all anticipated. And that has to do with the hardware not being where it should be, right? There's, there's limitations. There's form factor. There's having a battery that doesn't heat up when it's on your head. So typically they're not, not for HoloLens, but for other devices, they're, they're placed on your belt. Um, there's the optics, the field of view. Um, you know, back when HoloLens 1.0 came out, your field of view was, you know, something like, you know, something like this, you know, and, um, Magic Leap was a little bit better than that. Let's see when Apple comes out with theirs, right? I think a lot of people are betting on, on Apple's device. Um, I am. <laughs> You're like, by a lot of people, I mean me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think, I think when they crack that nut, I mean, like if there's anyone that has the resources to make everyone want it, <laughs> the design chops. Yep. The, yeah, it's going to be Apple and, 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 you know, like meta, you know, they're still in it to win it. Right. I think it's the psychology of the hardware too. Beyond like the technical limitations, like people don't want to wear goggles really. You know, I think we found that with Google glass, you know, Google glass and other wearable technologies is people, I, I mean, my opinion is when these become more inherent to our phone or to maybe to us as a, yeah. as an individual, I think it'll be absorbed much faster because I yeah. think there's a big hesitation about, you know, it, it, if it feels foreign, like people yeah. will think it's foreign. There's a psychology of it, at least and, yep. and uh, accessibility to the, to, to the hardware that needs to happen. I think before it would, would be totally absorbed. Yep. You use your phone for, for like three things. You use it to make calls and answer your phone. You use it to um, get uh, as a device to get on the internet, checking your mail, checking browsers or something like that, right? Purchases. And you also use it as a camera. Like those three things. You uh, conceivably will be able to do all three of those things with a pair of glasses that look just like this within a couple of years, maybe 10, something like that, right? the way way it's going today when that happens i'm not going to want to carry this thing around if i can uh, make calls by double tapping and it, it doesn't even need to be an earpiece i can hear it with through a through a speaker that apple's invented or meta's invented i don't um, Phone and connection then, on and that. then i can tap <laughs> here and i can the the website's not like not this small but this small <laughs> And, uh, and then, uh, I can take pictures with my, my, my phone, my, my glasses. Um, then I said, I, there's a, like, then it becomes, uh, not a, a, a need, a, a, not a want, but a need, you know, I need to have these because I don't want to carry this thing in my pocket. I'm tired of breaking and dropping it. Of a designer of physical things, you know, it makes me nervous that we'll be in a completely digital world. Yeah. And I do think that there are these tokens that will always want to, and maybe it is your glasses. And so you can touch them and just that, that'll be enough. Um, we talk about our identity or we, you know, give people signals through phys physical things, not only digital, you know, digital things. Um, and so, but, but again, maybe it's just because I'm a product designer and yep. I like physical stuff. 
you know, tech is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So, and getting closer and closer to the body. So the class, the glasses do feel like the perfect mechanism to get that out. But on top of that, like with, with cameras, you know, the, the buzzword that was, you know, early in AR was that the camera's phone, the, the phone's camera, I should say, the phone's camera was the next browser, meaning that physical things will have a signature them that the phone's camera will automatically trigger and activate something else, whether that's a browser or an AR piece or an art or an email or what have you. And so if I rename those three things before, like the, the making calls, uh, taking pictures, going on a browser will automatically be in the phone. So as we're walking around, if we opt into it, the, the, the camera will be always be tracking and looking for markers, QR codes, but QR codes in the future that will then prompt us and be a call to action of, of what we want to do with that, with that trigger. Are you a sci-fi fan? Look, I mean, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for, for a good Black Mirror episode. And I think those are brilliant. Now, almost all of them are fairly dystopian, which I'm, I'm more of an optimist. But Black Mirror for me is the epitome of seeing how tech and culture collide. Speaking of, yeah, optimistic and dystopian um, ideas, like I think we're getting more and more distant from the, the physical footprint and impact of all this data um of digital files you know we talked about all these um photos on your phone about how dynamic these nfts are getting and that takes up space somewhere yeah. where all the servers are yeah. it does have you know an impact yeah you know um there have been a lot of advances in energy consumption that are minting nfts so i wouldn't be the best person to talk on that but it was clear early on when there's a lot of um, brands, they're about to dip their toes in the NFT space, then quickly saw the backlash about how um, destructive for the environment just doing NFTs were, took their foot out. And so a lot of those um, entrepreneurs and developers realized that they had to fix that. And they they have made strong strides in addressing that. So, you know, those those like whether it's gas fee or the amount of consumption that energy of energy to make those, that has been addressed. I don't think that press is getting out there and maybe it's not widely um widely known or needed to talk about because there's other issues, but that is I th I think uh uh something that's also gonna be quickly figured out. Maybe a out. good part two. You can direct us to the right person <laughs> yeah. to interview for that. Yeah. Um, Cause I think that is a part of, like you said, it's come up a lot in the media and it's something that a yep. lot of people, Without a doubt. you know, skeptics point to definitely. Sure. All right. So we're almost out of time. We should wrap it up. We always do kind of the same questions at the end here. Okay. So what's something that's inspiring you outside of technology? Uh, I, 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 music, you know, I, I've always, um, uh, gone to music for inspiration, you know, since I was an eighth grader and discovered, you know, music as something that was transcendental and so powerful and could make me, uh, you know, emotionally moved. And so that's, that's whether it's, you know, running or working or driving, uh, um, I'm always trying to listen to music and be inspired by it. What are you playing lately? Uh, what am I playing lately? That's a good question. Uh, well, lately, um, U2 has released uh, their their new album. Although I'm not I'm not so happy with that. I bet Corey the, the, could have called that. Yeah, the two tracks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm surprised to everyone that knows you. Shocked. Uh, but um, who else am I listening to? Um, I I actually really enjoy the the, the Spotify's Discover Weekly. And believe it or not, I'm actually more of a indie rock guy. Uh, dare I say, sad dad rock. And um, so, <laughs> hashtag sad dad. Hashtag sad dad. 
So the national was on my playlist a lot and uh, a few of the other bands that, uh, you know, I, I used to uh, listen to in college, you know, uh, seam and the spinanes and, uh, you know, um, sunny day real estate, all these other, you know, kind of maybe, I guess it's called emo nowadays. I don't know. <laughs> Throwback emo. Yeah. And what's something in tech inspiring you? If there's anything that you haven't already discussed in our conversation well, today. I mean, the no brainer once again is AI. Um, that is. I know we didn't even really get to that. Yeah, that. <laughs> like that. Like you know, I, we'll look. We, we we currently look back at what it was like to design before the computer and after the computer. We're right now living in that moment where we're going to look back and say what it was like to work before AI and after AI. Absolutely, it is so clear, and. Um, it is inspiring. I'm, I'm embracing it. Um, I, um, my LinkedIn feed is nothing but mid journey posts. I teach part time as, as does uh, Corey. And, uh, it's a topic of lots of discussions with, with my students, um, how they, um, look to their futures and incorporate the tools of AI. Um, it's a topic of, um, production, even working right now on NFTs. Um, we're drawing a large inspiration off of um, off of AI right now. It is clearly uh, going to make our lives in the initial stages easier. Um, just coming up with, um, just getting started. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sometimes the hardest part is getting started to get that momentum. Like I'm a huge fan of momentum. I love momentum. Sometimes it's the hardest thing for me to grasp at. But when I'm when the ball's rolling and momentum is going, uh, it's sometimes so easy to finish, right? And so easy to 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 get where you want to go. Um, and I've found um, that AI is has just radically changed, changing the way we're thinking about making things today. And I think it's really powerful that you started your career with this. You know, you said already understanding the physical and digital digital twin or whatever you want to call it, you know, yeah. the digital version of what was happening in the physical world. So I think that probably helps to embrace it and see it's, you know, this is just the next wave of that. Um, yeah. one of many. Yeah. Look, it's interesting. I mean, I think, um, uh, my boss, Shane small was talking about this and he was, uh, he may have been repeating what he had heard too. He was talking about how, you know, during the Renaissance period, when painters were painting food or real to give like their client one for one depiction of them, right? Doing a portrait and the photography comes around and it's black and white. So like, okay, well I can do better than that. I'm going to pay paint in huge saturated color, vivid color. And then color photography comes out and they're like, okay, now as a painter, I'm going to go impressionistic and do large strokes and really show how I can interpret something that a, that a camera can't. And then comes along, uh, Photoshop, or Photoshop, <laughs> computer aided tech, you know, CAD, what have you. Um, so there's always been this kind of tug and, uh, tug of war between what, um, what an artist can do that, a, that, that tech can't at the same time, the ones that are most successful embrace that tech and just make their skill or their way of thinking or what they want to say even more profound. And so technology shifts technique. Correct. Without a doubt. And so my advice to students is, look, it's going to be up to you. I don't know the answer, but it's going to be up to you to figure out how to use that tool to, um, to say what you want to say, but even better. How can you be more human than the technology trying to be human yeah <laughs> you know? and and shane said look it's about bringing emotion into your work like that's it's so clear all right you want to ask the the last question that we always ask uh yeah uh <laughs> what's your bill of materials bill of materials magenta go you ahead nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not familiar with it's bill. up to interpretation what? what keeps you going what yeah. gets you up in the morning so I, i'm i'm a, i'm an avid drummer so I mean, a pair of, pair of sticks would definitely be in my pocket. You know, uh, embarrassingly enough, I you know my phone is also in my other pocket. Um, 
and uh, you know, I have a, a pair of keys in my my uh, classic Mini Cooper. Well, not classic, but you know, old old twenty year fifteen year old Mini Cooper. Um, it's more than fifteen, I think, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it might be more than fifteen now. I think in some ways I'm I'm not happy with those. Um, I do really like um, these Japanese pens. Do you know what I'm talking about? Corey, the ones from uh, Art Center, the Japanese the clear pens. ones, clear ones. I usually have one of those uh, uh, stuck to me, just in case I need to draw. How, how tall are you? Uh, six four. Yeah, he, we got to paint a picture for the, yeah, he's six, the listeners. <laughs> but he's always interested in the smallest car. And I asked him, <laughs> why the heck do you want that like really small car? He's like, because well, I think the way you put it was because. I wish I was small. Or I have a fascination <laughs> with being small. Is that correct? But I would think I say that. Just I mean, makes you feel was bigger. Was I saying over a couple of beers? Or what, what did I say? Perhaps <laughs> it was a long time ago. I would think that would make you feel bigger. Yes, time but, and time again, not feel smaller. Uh, Do you feel smaller I, when yeah. you're in it, driving around? <laughs> I haven't gone to therapy yet, but there is something <laughs> deeply psychological about it because I am I am very attracted to smaller cars. Um, and I, maybe it's, maybe it's, uh, I've always wanted to be a clown. Uh, I don't know. I think that's it. Well, you have the socks. Oh, I do have the socks. Yeah. Yeah. I just need the hair. Yeah. Well, on that note, <laughs> thank well, you so much. There was nothing Joe. clowning around about yeah. this discussion. I, I feel not. infinitely Wait smarter after listening to you. I hope Joe. I sounded so, smart. Yeah, you totally did. <laughs> All right, cool. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions in the comments. <laughs> We'll forward them all to you to answer right. directly. <laughs> Joey will have to yeah. answer that one. What we could do is we could we could do a supply frame token. And it'll Steve. be a private Discord channel. Can we and- get the sign off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think, honestly, we should talk to you guys about a SuperCon experience with the Hackaday community. Because that would be huge. So what's, what's even cooler than that is... Um, uh, Technically, I guess our CTO, our chief technology officer, but he goes under chief experience officer. He uh, he knows about supply frame, like he's a big fan, nice. um, and so he would be, he, yeah, he would drop everything to do that. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, Joey. You're very My welcome. Wheels are spinning. There were so many, <laughs> honestly, a lot of ways I wanted to keep going. Yeah, let's do it again. Let's do so it again. We'll, we'll have to do a. a we'll follow. do it again in the yeah in a couple of months. Thank you, Joey, for further explaining the growing Web3 space and where its continued improvement concepts and applications may hold in the future. And thank you, Corey, for joining me in our conversation. We'll see you on our next co-hosted episode. Candy Digital will be releasing limited release NFTs under the projects and brands it's currently working with, among several other Web3 powered media and content in the near future. A link to Candy Digital's homepage and Joey's portfolio can be found in the show notes. If you like The Bomb, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share the show wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow Supply Frame and Hackaday on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Design Lab at Supply Frame Design Lab on Instagram and Twitter. The Bomb is a Supply Frame podcast produced by me, Magenta Strongheart, and Ryan Tillotson. Written by Maggie Bulls and edited by Daniel Ferreira. Theme music is by Anna Hogbin. Show art by Thomas Schneider. Special thanks to Giovanni Salinas, Bruce Dominguez, Thomas Woodward, Jin Kumar, Jordan Clark, the entire Supply Frame team, and you, our wonderful listeners. I'm your host, Magenta Strongheart. See you next week.